Hi, I'm Kim. I work in the library on the Wexford campus of SETU and I'm here with Breda today. Hi, I'm Breda. I work in the SETU Carlo campus and I'm the Lifelong Learning and Research Services Librarian. So today we're discussing searching for information for assignments. So I'm going to uh, open the first question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, our first question is, what are the main steps that a student should take if they're starting to research a topic for an assignment? What do you think, Breda? Um, well, I would always say start on paper. Um, so, you know, because I'm old. But, um, you know, you might want to do that in a Word document either. So, mm -hmm. it's really starting to plan out what it is you have to look for. Yeah. So, if it's an essay topic or... Um, you know, some kind of um, uh, a writing based assignment, I would start to, I would start by writing out the actual title of the thing that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I think, think, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, always taking a step back, reading your assignment brief fully and then identifying the key concepts within it and um, like highlighting, okay, what am I being asked to search for here? And how would those key concepts then sort of translate into keywords? Because it'll be the keywords that you're using, I suppose, to search for information. So your, your journal articles, your uh, eBooks, your print books, whatever you're searching for, you're gonna be using keywords. And those keywords are gonna be generated from what the topic is actually asking you to do. So the, the key concepts within it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think by um, starting to plan out first before you even begin to search, because sometimes um, you might not even know where to search. Yeah. Um, so figuring out what kind of information you're looking for. So are you looking for an ebook or mm -hmm. are you looking for journal articles? Or are you looking for reports even? Because you might have to look in different places for those different things. But if you start on paper or a Word document, if you're not old like me, um, then um, it's a good way to really um, sort of focus on the topic and start to pick out those concepts. So what you're saying I think is absolutely right. Start to look at the main pieces that are you're being asked about. So what are those big broad concepts or topics mm -hmm. and that's when you'll start to think then about how you're going to search for those topics. Exactly yeah and I suppose with any kind of search process as well like you know, it's trial and error and it's iterative. So you're not going to, I suppose, do all of your searching in one chunk and then write everything up. You know, you're going to have to maybe refine some of those ideas and generate new keywords as you go. But I suppose in the initial stages, you really want to clarify what are the main topics of your assignment? How do they translate into keywords and then use those keywords to search for different types of information? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as you go on with that, then, I mean, you can use that piece that you're working on either on paper or on your Word document mm -hmm. and that iterative um, part comes in there that once you start to do the searching or even thinking, you know, even if you're not at the stage of searching, but thinking, you, you know, other words might come into play where you think, you know, a concept can be described in lots of different ways. Yeah. And, you know, you can just list those then on the page and start to get an idea um, uh, either in diagram form or in list form of, of what, how those concepts interact with one another mm -hmm. and how you would even think about forming the search that you're going to do. Yeah, yeah. Mind maps I find can be really helpful at that stage as yeah. well. And you know, your sort of your, your key concepts or your main topics then when you're doing your preliminary searching you know, you'll kind of find that you start to identify maybe subtopics or things relating to those things. So I always find yeah. mind maps, I'm a bit more of a visual yeah, person. So too, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sort of having mind maps where I can kind of see, okay, here are my, my key topics and here are the subtopics that are kind of nested in under that. Yeah. And they sort of generate their own sort of new keywords that I'll then use for yeah. searching for information. Yeah. So yeah, so main steps then initially, I would say we've... Yeah, so it's that. really just thinking and planning before you dive in to look. So it's really, like you said, about taking a step back. Yeah. Question two. Okay. So how much searching is normally done for information for an assignment and how long does that take? Oh, how long does it take? I mean, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> I think um, the search process, as we kind of said there, you know, it isn't sort of a, a linear or discrete section of your writing or your, your, your process, I suppose. You're not going to, you know, get your assignment brief, do your neat little chunk of searching and then go off and write your assignment and they kind of happen in discrete steps. They often kind of overlap with each other. So you could do your search process and have a lot of great sources that you found through your initial searches and you have all them in your notes and you're using them to write. And as you're writing, 
you might find actually I could use you know an additional source here to back up this point or maybe I've neglected something in the assignment brief that I need to include and then you go back to your search process so the search process I think can be sort of very fluid like so many things in life it tends to not be that linear or straightforward a process um, so how much searching is done I think that's a very it's a very difficult question to answer really yeah, I mean, you could go on forever and ever. There's so much yeah. information out there. Exactly. You know, that yeah. you could keep searching forever, but we're not advocating for that at all. No. I suppose <laughs> it really goes back to the first question in that, and about maybe defining your topic and looking at your topic and really thinking about what it is you're searching for. Mm. So that planning that you've done already in that first step can actually help you to, um, I suppose, hone your search um, and define your boundaries so yeah. that can actually help an awful lot in terms of so you'll know maybe when you're finished or you know actually uh you know i don't want to go into that part of it because that's not really what i'm looking for mm -hmm. so the, the the first step will help to um help you to not go off track maybe mm. um but you know at some point with searching there is that thing that there's so much out there that where do i stop Sometimes you just have to say to yourself, I think I have enough information now yeah. or I need to start analysing the information that I do have. So, you know, maybe it's good to have the knowledge that this could go on forever and ever and be aware of that. And it's nothing that you're doing wrong, but yeah. you have to stop yourself from searching and really look at what it is you're being asked. Exactly. You know? I think we've all fallen prey to that a little bit of, you know, sort of going down... <laughs> <laughs> all these Rabbit different holes. avenues like as you say there's so much information out there and I think it's really easy to you know kind of get distracted and go this is a really interesting research paper and then suddenly you find that you've spent you know it could be minutes or hours going down a particular rabbit hole that's not at all related yeah. to the assignment brief so I think making sure that you maintain a focus in your searching is really important and that's going to be informed by the assignment so what, what you're being yeah. asked to do so as you say, going back to that first step, you know, you, you have to really sort of think about what you're being asked to do and sort of define those parameters for yourself. And as you're searching, make sure that you're not going off down too many yeah, rabbit holes. Sure. I think it's kind of, you know, it's really important when you're searching as well to keep a record of what you're finding. And if, you know, you find that suddenly you have tons and tons and tons of sources and maybe they're all saying the same thing. You can start to kind of refine those as you go and maybe include or exclude certain sources at that stage. Mm -hmm. So maintaining a focus is is definitely yeah. important. You don't want to go too broad. And I mean, this thing about how long does it take, um, you know, that it is important that you're kind of keeping an eye on that as well and that you're not spending an awful long time just searching and searching and searching because mm -hmm. you do have to come back. It's only one step. You do have to come back and start to analyse and critically appraise the things that you have found yeah. and that takes time too but I suppose you mentioned it earlier about it being an iterative process and a non-linear process so you maybe you know in the first instance you might sit down having planned out your um, your search and what it is you're going to be looking for um, and you might then search for 20 minutes for example in a few databases yeah. um, and then you'll you might go and appraise that information and see is this suiting you know what I'm looking for is it answering the questions is it is it going to back up the points that I want to make about the topic mm -hmm. um, and it might turn out that actually you need more information or you need better information or you yeah. need to focus or your focus might change you know from and this is part of the iterative thing yeah you might even go back to paper and say okay I want to go this way and I want to look m more deeply into this aspect of the topic mm -hmm. and then you've got to search again so yeah. that's the iterative part and it's that's why it's so hard to define how long it takes mm -hmm. but I suppose the thing I always say to students is don't leave it too late yeah. because of the time that it takes you know so although it's hard to define how long it will take um, you need to allow enough time for that iterative yes. process to actually happen because you will find that you know you want to do that yeah you know yeah as absolutely. you start to read and look mm -hmm. okay so our next question here is what are the pitfalls to avoid when searching for information that's a hard one, actually. Um, there are so many pitfalls. <laughs> yeah. Um, I suppose one of the things that I would say is um, to, uh, you, you know, you've got to think broadly mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, ideas and concepts when you're, when you, and I know we, we've mentioned this earlier, 
um, and, and talking about concepts and maybe we should talk about that a little bit and explain what we mean so yeah. um, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm talking about that because I, I do think that people can it's, can focus too narrowly so their 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 essay title um, if they think broadly about the idea and start with that search mm -hmm. um, it will really help them to refine the search and to find broad information. And I, yeah. I hope I'm explaining that well enough. Um, it, always start with the higher level ideas and keywords and concepts. Mm -hmm. I think if you start narrow, that's the first pitfall that you're going to fall into because you'll think there's nothing there or there's not very much information there. Yeah. Whereas if you define the topic um, in the broadest way possible, you're going to be a lot more expansive. Your inf the information that you find is going to be a lot more expansive. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can narrow down from, from that yourself. Whereas, so you're in control of how you're narrowing down the information. Yeah, yeah. so, so not having sense. too narrow a focus, I suppose, initially. Yeah. Um, I suppose thinking of, um, you know, hyponyms or hypernums. So if you are looking for... I don't know, initially your broad topic might be canines and then kind of a hyponym, so a, a narrower term for that then might be a breed, like a dog or a breed of a dog, like a Labrador or an Alsatian, you know, so you're kind of starting with the broader concept and then narrowing as you go. But I suppose a pitfall in the initial stages can be having either too narrow a focus, so you're getting very few search results for what you're looking for, mm -hmm. or sometimes it can also be a pitfall to have too broad a focus where you know maybe you've gone much wider than your assignment brief and you find that you're getting tens of thousands or tens of millions if you're searching on Google Scholar uh, search results that you then can't you can't parse yeah, like how you do you even begin it. yeah exactly um, I suppose another pitfall in searching for information is if you haven't done that initial planning stage of really thinking about what you're looking for Mm -hmm. And then you sort of end up with either very irrelevant search terms um, that take you way beyond your assignment brief and away from your topic that you're actually searching for. Mm -hmm. People can get very frustrated then. I suppose if yeah. you're not finding what you're looking for and you're either getting too few or far too many results, yeah. the temptation is to kind of go, oh, God, yeah, you know. And, and too much. Exactly, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think another thing as well is searching in the right place. Absolutely, um, yeah. So, and that can be a bit of a tricky one because say in our online library, in the, um, uh, the SETU online library, um, there's so many places to look, you know, exactly. there's so many different databases. And I suppose maybe what students mightn't think about is, um, you know, we cover the range of topics that we teach. Mm -hmm. So if you're not an engineering student, searching in an engineering database for say information about early childhood education you're not going to get results exactly but they might not know they're searching in the wrong place yes so maybe finding out where to search and i suppose you know there's help on the library website that can help with that absolutely you the know. subject guides are fantastic so if you go into um the subject guide section of the, the library you can find specific kind of broken down guides related to the subject areas so whatever your degree program might be you'll find recommended books, ebooks, uh, journals, databases, websites, there's loads of information there to mine. Yeah. So I think That's initially... That's a really good starting point yes, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I come back to them all the time. You yeah. know, there's, um, they're, they're updated very regularly because there'd be new titles coming in and new recommendations coming in. They're curated by the subject librarian. So you really mm -hmm. are getting a lot of really good sources there that you can mine in your assignments. Yeah. And then obviously the databases as well. So you can do your searching, you know, through one inquiry through the online search field and it will search across all the databases. But then if you want to go into the A to Z database list, you'll find subject specific databases in there mm -hmm. that will kind of give you a more precise search for what you're looking yeah. for, I suppose. So, yeah. yeah. So knowing where to look for the information yeah. that you're trying to find, you know. Yeah. And also equally, like if, if you want to search for ebooks, make sure you're searching in an ebook database. You yeah. Know, that, that's, yeah. That's really important. too. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, question four. Mm -hmm. So we're often told to use only reputable sources of information. What are these exactly and what sources should we prioritise? Okay, so I suppose um, this kind of comes down to having an ability to critically evaluate the information 
that you're looking at. So often with reputable sources, what that would really mean is kind of scholarly sources or academic or peer reviewed journals or academic textbooks. Um, and when you're searching, I suppose, through the SETU libraries, you can do things in your search, like you can tick peer reviewed to only get you know, mm -hmm. results that are from peer reviewed publications, uh, or you can you know, tick ebooks to only get you know, things that are published mm -hmm. in ebooks. Mm -hmm. But if you're doing a lot of your searching through something like Google, um, you're going to get tons and tons of search results and they're, they're coming from all different types of sources. So it could be blogs or, uh, you know, newspapers or social media. It could be coming from all sorts mm -hmm. of places. So it's how do you assess whether something is reputable? So is it authoritative? Is it credible? Is it something that's appropriate to, to cite in an assignment? Mm -hmm. So I suppose with that, you need to know how to look, you know, look at the information, question it. So Who's the author of the information? Is it, you know, an academic or a doctor? Are they linked to any institute or, you know, college or university? Maybe doing a bit of a, sub, uh, a search of the author to see, you know, are they reputable? Are they publishing elsewhere? Are, there, are, they, are they publishing in a lot of different places? And um, what's the site that the information is actually coming from? So searching that and seeing, you know, okay, is it, is it you know, a proper sort of verified authoritative source? And mm -hmm. um, is the information current or up to date? And um, like often, I suppose with research, you don't want to necessarily be including stuff in your writing that's very outdated or very old because there could have been a lot of research since then that maybe disproves what was published in that mm. particular source. So um, I suppose those would be the kind of things when, you're, when we're talking about things being yeah, reputable. reputable. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that when you're searching through, say, the databases that we have, that we provide for students through the online library, um, most of the thing or all of the things that are in there are, are reputable and those, you know, a lot of the um, information that you're going to find will be academic journals mm -hmm. and by and large they're peer-reviewed journals so you're you're fine with that it's more when you go outside of those sources that you've got to start to think critically about maybe YouTube videos or podcasts or something like that if you're using those that that's when you really need to apply that as well isn't that right that, yeah you know, absolutely yeah you're, yeah you're, thinking critically about the yeah. source yeah yeah I suppose that's it isn't it like not yeah. all information is created equally yeah um, absolutely you know and I think this extends even past kind of you know academic searching you know even if you're searching for health information or, or you know mm. political information online whatever it might be you know there's so many pitfalls in searching for things you know online because it can be hard to tell whether something is, is credible correct. and to yeah. be trusted or not so yeah having that sort of extra layer of sort of criticality where you're sort of going okay who is the author of this piece where is it being published when is it be, has it been published? Um, why has it been published? Has it been funded by a particular organization? organization? All of that, like looking for bias in information. Like these are all kind of critical skills, I think, that are so important, obviously in academia, but, but in the real world as well, you know? I think another thing as well is that um, it depends on the discipline that you're working in or that you're studying. Yeah. So sometimes you might need to check. So for example, if you're a drama student, um, you know, possibly a YouTube video of a performance is a reputable source. Yeah. You know, whereas maybe in other fields, YouTube videos don't stand up as much. So it really depends on the discipline. And I suppose I would always say to students, you know, go back and check with your lecturer mm. to make sure, you know, if there's something that you are concerned about, if you've done all of those checks, but you're still not sure, mm. you know, do certainly check with the le lecturer to see if this will be um, seen as a reputable source of information, you know, if you're if you're still not 100% sure about yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, question five. Uh, what practical tips do you have, for example, saving searches, using limitation or exclusion, accessing databases off campus, etc.? So, practical tips. Well, first of all, accessing databases off campus. So, all of our databases are can be searched off campus. So, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which mm -hmm. is brilliant. Um, so, and you know, you just need to have your student log in, um, and you know, you can save that on, on the computer. So, there should be no difficulties with that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of saving searches, uh, most of the databases now will allow you to save your search, which is really brilliant because. And it goes back to the iterative part. You can see how your search is changing. Yeah. So if you change a keyword, you can, you know, in the fourth time you search, you can see, the, you know, how you've changed 
oh, you know, all those steps going back, which is really useful. Yeah. Um, because it can, you know, it can plot your thinking. It can help you to see how your your search has changed over time since you've been, you know, dipping in and out of things and, and reading. Mm -hmm. Um, and what you can do as well, which is brilliant, is you can if once you've finalize that search and you've, you've decided okay these are the keywords that I'm, I'm using to search for the concepts that I want to cover you can actually set up an alert mm. so that it will in it will actually alert you when something comes in um, that's new into the database and that's that's really brilliant because um, even while you're sort of planning your essay you can still be told about something new that, that's been published that, that might um, link to what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, kind of on a practical note, um, keeping a record of your searches as you go. So having like a Word document open, one column, like a two column table, one column is all of your references. So you can actually export your citation or copy and paste your, your citation from within the library records a lot of the time. If you look down the, the right hand column, there'll be a little toolbar with a cite option and you can then select the citation style or the referencing style. Here it's Harvard and you can actually just copy and paste that into your Word document. So you have your full reference there in your left column. Always check it against the university style guide just to make sure it's consistent. And then another column beside your citation that just has a little couple of notes on what this uh, article say covers um, and what you might use it for in your piece of writing. So you're putting all of this time and effort into searching. So it's, I think it's really important to actually make sure that you're recording all of that yeah. as you go. Because you, you, know, you don't want to close your browser down and then lose all of that work that you've done. You will never remember all the titles or the the journals that you looked in. So I think sort of having a document open simultaneously while you're searching and recording what you're finding useful as you go yeah. is really important. That's a time saver, isn't it? Absolutely, well? yeah. yeah. I mean, often, you know, it could be years since you found an article that you used in one essay. You could have moved on to another module two years down the line and go, God, there was a really good article that I read for though, for though on this. And but if you go back your into notes. your Word document for that, you yeah. know, module that you've kept, you'll have it there. Yeah. Um, so I would say that always keep a record of your search as you go. Um, and even within, I suppose, the library search as well, there's a lot of really useful tools um, just for to filtering. kind of, yeah, yeah, just for filtering, for saving your searches, for creating folders. Um, like say, for example, in eBook Central, if you're signed in, you can create a bookshelf. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really useful yes, one, isn't really it? Yes, it's really useful, yeah. yeah. So it'll record, um, all of the books that you've searched previously. And if you've made any highlights or notes on any of those books, mm. um, you can retrieve all of those again in your next session of searching. So that's yeah, a really that's good really one useful. to know about as well. That one about using limitations or exclusions, that's a kind of a really important one when you are searching because it allows you to connect your keywords, you know, so it's your yeah. ands and your ors. Um, uh, and I mean, for students who want to dive into it deeper it's called boolean searching mm -hmm. um we librarians love searching, talking about boolean searching um it's it's where you're you use the words and or or and is to combine two search terms mm -hmm. and the data this is how databases work you know they work on these terms um uh and if or you can use or if you want to um allow for other different keywords yeah. and there's a, there's a bit of work around kind of working how working out how that works but if you know you can search for videos in YouTube yeah. about boolean searching and how it can help you help you to kind of to to sculpt a search I suppose um, but that can be um, a, a really really important tool in in getting your search right in in a database absolutely yeah I think boolean searching is a really really great skill to have and it takes practice but I think it's really worthwhile and even things like truncation searching can really save you a lot of time because rather than having to do the same search for different forms of the same word you can search for different forms of that one word in a single inquiry so say for example yeah. If you were to search for develop with your little asterisk as a truncation search, you're going to get results with develop, development, developers, anything with that keyword in it. So you're actually mm -hmm. performing multiple searches in Just sort of in one, one fell swoop. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pop into the library uh, and ask yeah, anyone who was anyone searching. Yeah. We'd be very, very happy to, yeah. to, to give instruction. Yes, the absolutely. The other one that's really useful as well is phrase searching. Yes. Um, yeah. That's a brilliant tool and you can combine it then with the Boolean searching as well. It's where you can't 
um, reduce a concept to one single word or one keyword. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got a phrase, um, I'm trying to think of something like climate change is a good example. Yeah. So you cannot get climate change down to one single word. Um, so if you put it into inverted commas yeah. um, and sure, search for it instead, yeah, then it, the, the database will return examples of, of that phrase only and it won't split up yes. the, um, the phrase, which is, it just makes it a much more focused uh, search with much better results. So that's a really good tip, I think. Okay, so Kim, we're going to talk about citations now. Fantastic, my favourite thing. <laughs> okay, so I'll just open the first question. Okay. Why is referencing so important? So, um, referencing when you are, you know, writing an academic essay or piece of work, um, it is really important because a lot of what you are saying in your essay needs to be backed up by evidence. And the evidence that you are citing will be taken from other sources, so previously published sources. So it's really important that whenever you include an idea or a fact or a piece of information that you've obtained from another source, that you cite that appropriately. So you're giving credit to the author um, who originally published that piece of work. Um, and that is vital because I suppose all academic writing or scholarly communication, it's a conversation. So in your writing, you're building on the ideas and developing the ideas of, of others. Um, so it's really important that you properly cite and credit where those ideas have come from. Yes, yeah, so you're not claiming them as your own yeah. ideas, but you are including them in the things that you want to say. Exactly. So it's very, very different um, to school. So if for a student who's just come from school, mm. it's really turning it all on its head. You know, in school, the teacher um, might tell you to learn something or you can learn something straight from a textbook mm -hmm. and then you can reproduce it in an exam or in an essay. It's so different, um, you know, at this level, at third level, yeah. it's it's almost the opposite. You know, you've got to say exactly where you got that information. Yeah. Um, and it's really useful to use the work of others because it's like you say, you're getting involved in this academic conversation mm -hmm. um, you're putting out your own ideas, but you're showing how you formed those ideas. And you're, you know, you're not claiming that that you've created all the work but you're showing where you got the information from and what evidence you've used to yeah. kind of to come to the point where you're making your own um, point in your, your writing. Yeah. So it's really, really important. And I mean, um, it's not just that you're part of the academic conversation. There's this other part of it that we talk about, which is plagiarism. You know, the flip side of referencing, if you don't say where you got something, you can be accused of plagiarism, which is like academic theft. It's like stealing the ideas of someone else. Mm. Um, so you've really got to be very careful about it as well. Yeah. Um, and, and that's why it's very, very important. I mean, if I was the person, say, correcting the assignment, the reference that you make um, to someone else's piece of work, so someone else's book or someone else's YouTube video or podcast um, or academic journal article, um, that will allow me to go back to that source and check exactly. where it's come from. So that's why it's very important as well. You know, it allows the reader to go back to the item that you're referencing. Absolutely. And I suppose as well, you know, referencing the work of others, it gives sort of weight and authority to your own point as well. You're kind of saying, I'm making this point and this is my, my theory or my thesis about this particular to topic. But I also have a lot of evidence to back that up. I'm not just plucking an idea out of the sky. It's corroborated by all of these other sources and as you say then by properly citing and referencing it means the reader can go back and see okay this is the actual article that they took this from or this is that piece of research you're making it easy for the reader yeah, to go and do their it. own research as well so, yeah. yeah okay so question two do i have to support everything i say with a reference okay so you don't have to support everything that you say with a reference um uh, so if something is common knowledge, then you don't need to reference that. So the capital of France is Paris. You know mm -hmm. that, we know that. Um, and you don't need to find a source for that. But a good rule of thumb is that you should reference anything if you are unsure whether or not it falls outside the area of common knowledge. Okay. So err on the side of caution with that. Knowing whether or not you have to support something that you're saying with a reference, it, it is kind of a tricky question. Um, if you're using a framework for your writing, something like Peel, which is point, evidence, explain, link, uh, there's more of this actually on how to do this framework within the HELP program and on the PACE program as well. Um, so if you were taking a paragraph, for example, and the P of Peel is your point. 
So this is the point that you're making at the outset. You're telling the reader what this paragraph's going to be about or what your, your opinion is on this particular theme or topic. You wouldn't necessarily have to cite that. The next thing would be your evidence, so the E in Peel. This is the studies that you've drawn on to sort of inform what you're saying. So you would need to cite that appropriately because you've taken that information from a different source. So you need to have your in-text citation and your full reference in your bibliography at the end. Then the second E in Peel would be explain. So this is your own explanation of your understanding of these studies that you found. You wouldn't necessarily have to cite that, mm -hmm. nor would you necessarily have to cite your link. So the L in Peel, the last sentence of your paragraph that would link back to your main topic. So I suppose that the, the key thing really is that if you're taking information um, from any other source, you do need to cite that appropriately and fully. Yeah, and I think the framework idea is a really good one because it can help students to structure their own ideas you know the work the evidence from other people that they're using mm. and then tie it in you know tie in their discussion around it so it can be a really useful way um, to structure arguments and to make sure that you are linking back and referencing correctly yeah. because it is tricky you it know is. and it does tie back into the whole um academic writing piece and th like that's how there's a big learning curve with that especially when you're starting out mm. you know it's very different it's a very different way of structuring your arguments and, and structuring your writing mm. and there is support around that as well so there's lots of support from the teaching and learning center there's you know an academic writing tutor that you can link in there's lots of information on blackboard and in other places as well around academic writing yeah. and you know that's something that you're going to learn right the way through your time um, in uh, SETU you know it's not something that you're expected to knock on the head with your first assignment you know you're learning you're um, upskilling all the way right yeah. throughout you know your whole time here so you know Absolutely. don't feel that you have to get that right the first time mm. it takes practice yeah okay so question three then what should I do to better integrate the ideas of others into my work without having lots of long quotes? Yes, um, so I suppose with, with quotation, like it's fine to include the odd quote in your writing. So if it is, I don't know, a direct um, you know, definition of a particular thing or something a person has said or something from a, you know, if it's a film script or a play script, you can include a, a quotation, so a direct you know, verbatim quote of what the source material says, but really you don't want to be relying on that at all in your writing. What you want to be doing is paraphrasing. So you are basically summarizing in your own words what that particular source has said on this topic. So you're, you're, you're sort of taking uh, that initial work and you're sort of, you're critically evaluating it yourself and then you're, you're putting it into the context of your own writing. Um, and to go a step further than that, I suppose, you can synthesize information. So that's where you're not just paraphrasing from one particular source, but you're synthesizing the information from lots of different sources. So if you're keeping good notes as you're searching, you can see across different sources, are there sort of comparisons in what the research is saying? And you're summarizing those across all the different sources, including an in-text citation that refers to all of those sources. Um, or is there contrast in the research? So you're, you're synthesizing things, you're putting it into your own words. You're not just copying and pasting chunks of text from one source into your own writing. Yeah. And I think as well, with your assignment, you you know, there maybe your essay is 2,000 words or 4,000 words or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you've got a very tight amount of words. You don't want to really be using someone else's words. What the, the, the lecturer or the, the person correcting the piece is really interested in is what do you, that they're interested in what do you think yeah what's you know what's your take on this topic uh, and they really want to know what do you have to say about this so if you're using the words of others in long quotations you're not actually um, I suppose maximizing the effect that you can have now having said that I do think that a quotation from text a long quotation can be really powerful if you're only doing it once and it's a really important piece and it's a very important piece to the idea that you've got or you know to the maybe the, the background to the topic mm. and it can be a very powerful piece in 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 your own writing you know so you've got to use it um to good effect mm. and minimally yes you minimally. know and you can you can do short quotes yeah. from um a sentence uh, and then paraphrasing which is you know the, the the other thing that you can do which is i suppose um, I would find the most difficult way um, of, 
of, of using someone else's work because you've got to do that synthesis. Yes. You know, you've got to really understand what they're saying and, um, you know, you've got to really show why it's important. And, and you're ty- it's, it's the, I suppose, the last step, that academic writing piece where you're really getting into the flow and you're able to um, paraphrase the work, you know. So when you're doing that well, you know, you've really knocked it on the head, I suppose. Um, it takes practice. It, it does. takes time. Yeah. It does. And I suppose that the thing to remember as well, if you are including quotes in your writing, the in-text citation will be slightly different. So you'll include anything that you're quoting directly inside quotation marks. And in your in-text citation, you'll always include reference to the page number as well. So you do need to be aware of that, that the in-text citation will look slightly different if you are quoting. There are different rules around how you quote. And there's a good piece in um, Credit Where Credit Is Due about that. So that's our document on SETU Harvard um, references so you will find some information in there yes. and in the PACE uh, module 3 as well so yes. there's information there about that okay so question 4 is when I'm advised to read more widely what should I do um, that's probably very good advice it means I suppose just reading beyond what's um, what you have been doing I suppose um, it means maybe um, casting your search net a little broader yeah. so read some other ebooks uh, on the topic mm-hmm. or maybe read some of you know if there's a set book or journal article or ebook maybe some of the other items that are referenced within there that can be a good starting point yeah you know um on a topic and we call we actually call that in searching when we're searching for information the snowball technique Mm -hmm. where you use this item that you've been told to read and then you use the references to to cast your net out further so that can be a really good starting point you know to read more widely yeah absolutely i think you know, you'll obviously have your uh, prescribed reading for each module, you'll have your essential reading and you'll have your recommended reading and you know those have been set by, by your lecturer. Um, but then going beyond that, as you say, it's mining the references within those pieces for more information and for more search to kind of go broader and broader and broader. And I suppose too, it goes back to that piece about searching. You know, if, even if you're not um, researching for a particular assignment if you're just reading around a particular topic maybe in the earlier stages of a module and you want to really deepen your understanding of a particular area Mm -hmm. you use that keyword isolation technique there as well so what are the key themes or topics um, that I'm looking to find out more about what will be the keywords that will capture some of those concepts and again going back to the library search engine and finding you know relevant um, journal articles or ebooks on that or going into the publications tool and finding mm-hmm. journals within that as well and um, these are all ways that you can kind of broaden your, your yeah. reading and deepen your understanding then of a topic yeah they're all good suggestions yeah so question five then what advice do you have around proofreading Ah, yes, this can be a tricky thing and um, I mean it seems really obvious to say but I suppose in the first instance the spell check function on Word that's inbuilt is your friend. <laughs> so have your spell check function on and it will flag up um, any sort of spelling errors. It will also flag up, as you know, in words, grammatical and yeah. um, like syntactic kind of issues um, mm-hmm. in particular phrases as well. You can go back and revise some of those. I often think um, sometimes with proofreading, coming to something with fresh eyes is nearly the mm-hmm. best thing you can do. So if you've been doing loads and loads of writing and you're getting up to a deadline, stepping away mm. <laughs> For a little bit of time and then coming back to it and reading it through fresh you'll often catch a lot of maybe little errors that way that you didn't see the first time around what do you think yeah i think that's brilliant advice yeah i would always try and do that myself yeah what you do need there is time with you that do. you know <laughs> so it doesn't work with a last minute thing and you'll often find that if you hand something in kind of last minute um you know afterwards you'll see mistakes that you yeah. made that you definitely would have caught if you had done that you know even if it's only if time is tight 30 minutes go have a walk Go and do something completely different and come back to it. But preferably, I would say, leave it overnight, uh, you know, for your definitely for your final proofreading anyway. Yeah. Um, and you'll catch lots of things. And I think that can work as well, even beyond proofreading with around how you're structuring yeah. something or how you're even, um, I, I suppose, um, you know, even approaching something in your writing. Mm-hmm. That that little element of 
going away, taking a breather, and then going back to it, you'll see things, and you'll even while you're away from it, you'll be thinking about it, even you know, unconsciously, yeah. uh, and it can improve improve what you you know what you're going to present at the end. So, yeah. um, sometimes if it's a big piece of work, I would suggest maybe someone else read it as well, and they might spot things, even though they, they might not know anything about the topic, mm -hmm. they might spot things that you haven't seen. Yeah, and so I think too help. with with really good academic writing, it's not about using sort of lots of sort of complex words or fancy terms for things. It should be something that a, a reader, you know, who's coming to a topic fresh can understand. That, that shows there's real clarity in your writing and, and that you understand what it is you're talking about and that you can communicate it in sort of a succinct way. Yeah. Um, so that piece of having, you know, somebody else read uh, your work can also, mm. you know, can really flag up where maybe things are not as clear as they might be or, um, yeah, things that you might want to rework sentences or whole paragraphs sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, having a bit of time for the proofreading yeah. Um, yeah. Is, is a good idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good advice for life, really. Step <laughs> away and come back with fresh eyes. <laughs> okay, Kim, I think we've covered all the questions mm -hmm. that we had and they were really good questions, I think. Um, is there anything else? maybe from the two topics that we didn't cover? Um, well, I suppose, yeah, just to say, like, with, with both kind of the search process and with referencing and citation and academic writing, like, these things do take practice. So it can be very easy, I think, uh, you know, initially to get very frustrated with the process, and it can be frustrating in the early stages, but be patient with yourself. Mm. Um, and also know that there are a lot of supports to help you along the way. So you can pop into the library at any time for supports on any of the topics that we've covered today. There's the subject guides on the library website, there's the help program that we're doing this as a part of, there's the PACE program. There's so many sources out there that you can draw on to, to scaffold your learning and to help you along the way. So yeah. I think if people can just know that we're, we're here to support them and yeah. there's lots of supports available. And I suppose the thing, the other thing is that, you know, students don't have to learn how to do all this at once, you know, um, you know, take it in bits and it may be your first assignment. That's a really good starting point, you know, to start using the resources, to start looking at the help that's available and to start using that help as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll learn more as you go along, but, you know, that's a really great starting point, I think. Yeah, absolutely.